Howdy, 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 folks. I'm Kanaju, it's 2024, and I am excited to share with you a video that has taken me all year long to make. Have you ever wondered how many unique planet archetypes can be generated with No Man's Sky's current algorithms? You ever wonder about how few planet types there were at launch and how exponentially it's grown since then? Well, whether you actively play No Man's Sky or not, if you click this video, I bet you have wondered. So then, <laughs> boy, do I have a video for you. Join me as I attempt the impossible. Answering the eternal question, how many planet types are actually possible in No Man's Sky? From a few thousand combos at launch to possibly a few million today, I'm covering how the procedural generation works, how much variety has improved over the last seven years, and why many players feel like planets still aren't varied enough. They're not wrong, by the way, but it's complicated. I'll be interpreting No Man's Sky's algorithm through two completely different methodologies in order to paint as complete a picture as possible. We're looking at the mathematical and the emotional. It's going to be a real video today. I hope you'll enjoy it. I think you will. So, when I said attempt and the impossible a minute ago, I meant it. Luckily, I have some experience with programming and game design, and even a little bit of procedural generation. That said, this is no simple task for a number of reasons. First off, I need to create a comprehensive list of variables that the planet generation algorithm will take into account. For example, whether a planet is a dense jungle or a desert is decided by its biome subtype. Whether or not it has deep canyons or gentle hills depends on its terrain archetype. Both of those are variables. Whether or not it has oceans is another variable. Everything from weather systems to architecture is determined by variables based on weighted probabilities. And that leads us to the second challenge of deciphering the algorithm, dealing with nested or dependent variables and weighted probabilities. For example, a planet's metal resource deposits are based on the color of the star it orbits. So if a planet orbits a yellow star, you'll find copper. If it orbits a red star, you'll find cadmium and so on. However, just because there are four possible options, copper, cadmium, emerald, and indium, that doesn't mean every planet has four options. You see, there are some biomes that can only exist around specific stars. So while some planet variants might have four versions, one for each metal type, others can only have one. And let me tell you, that is like the simplest example. We have variables for weather patterns, creature density, grass type, the height of trees, the depths of oceans, and anything else you can imagine. So to reiterate, we have to compile a list of variables, and we have to figure out how those variables interact. Luckily for me, I finally purchased a copy of No Man's Sky on PC. Whew, can you believe it after all these years? And I got it on sale too, 30 bucks. So now I can peek into the files and see every variable and probability for version 4.48, the current version. Problem solved, right? Wrong. You see, the last, most contentious problem I have to solve is where to draw the line. Technically speaking, there were 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,616 unique planets and moons in the game at launch. <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. No matter how similar they may have felt to some people, there was technically something unique about each and every one. It might be a different combination of colors and terrain or animals and plants or even the size of the planet and its name. There were 18 quintillion quote unquote unique planets in the game. But of course, anyone who played more than a couple dozen hours would be able to point out that a lot of those 18 quintillion planets felt quite similar to each other. Sure, these two dead planets are technically different, and they are different, but they play similarly. They have the same sentinels, the same lack of plants and animals, so a casual visitor might find them boringly similar. And I agree to a certain extent. Sure, every planet was unique, but 
surely they could be categorized based on various attributes, right? For example, these are both dead worlds, so you could say they're the same planet type. These are both deserts, another planet type. It didn't take long for players to recognize recurring and shared elements between planets, and so began the cataloging of planet types, which is sort of what I'm trying to do today. So when I told you that the most contentious problem to solve is where to draw the line, I meant it. After all, if I take every variable into account, I'll end up with 18 quintillion plus unique planets, right? So I need to define precisely what I mean when I say planet types or planet variants. Let me briefly walk you through how I would define the planet types in version 1.03, which was the launch version of the game available in 2016. As my chemistry teacher slash mortician once said while leading us into a morgue full of dissected bodies, follow me. So let's start with our first variable, the biome. The original No Man's Sky had seven biomes. Lust, I mean, <clears throat> lush, toxic, scorching hot, radioactive, cold as hell, my favorite, and dead. Within each of these biomes were countless combinations of plants and colors, but for many players, a forest planet with green grass felt pretty much the same as a forest planet with purple grass. I wasn't one of those players, but uh, I can see where they're coming from. So color palettes and specific plant grass combos won't factor into how I define a planet type. Instead, I'd like to focus more on variables that make a planet play differently, <laughs> in theory. While every planet's unique visuals were certainly a treat, being able to experience new scenarios on each planet is what most players probably looked forward to. Here's a good example of a variable that had a big impact on both visuals and gameplay. Water. A planet with bodies of water could have underwater fauna, flora, and buildings that simply wouldn't exist on a dry version of that same planet. It affects how the landscape looks, and it adds an additional survival mechanic. So, we have seven biomes that can either be water worlds or dry. If we wanted to figure out the number of possible combinations mathematically, which we do because I'm not about to count everything manually, we could simplify that to an equation of seven times two. You know, seven biomes, two options for water. That gives us 14 possible planet variants to begin with. Nice. So now let's factor in the three possible alien races that could inhabit a planet. At that time, every planet was home to Gek, Viking, or Korvac settlers. So this variable affects the architecture of buildings, which language is used, the types of puzzles and NPC encounters you'll have. In other words, it affects gameplay and visuals. So we multiply our previous number, 14, by the three races, and we arrive at a new total of 42 planet variants. Not bad, right? That's pretty much how I'm going to be approaching this problem. So for version 1.03, I've selected a total of six variables with which to define our planet types. Those are planet's biome, whether or not it has water, how extreme the weather is, which faction controls it, how its sentinels behave, and lastly, which terrain archetype it's based on. These are the characteristics I think most folks would identify a planet by. You know, a lush planet with extreme sentinels, uh, a dead planet with large oceans, or maybe a desert planet with extreme sandstorms, and so on. These are also some of the simplest variables to account for. Variables such as which combinations of creatures might spawn on a particular planet, if any, are more difficult to account for. While large diplos would definitely be a defining feature of a planet if found, I'm leaving specific combinations of plants and animals off of this list for now. Don't worry, before you write in the comments, I will circle back to how all of these variables affect our planets in the second half of this video, after I show you all of my initial calculations. All right, so let's get to the fun part, actually calculating how many planet types there were in the original launch version of No Man's Sky, based on these six variables, of course. Here's the equation I'm using. <laughs> Don't laugh though, I'm, I'm not. A mathematician or statistician or anything of that kind. I'm sure I'll get some comment correcting me in the comments below saying my equation should be different, but I'm keeping it simple here. You work your way from the top down. As you'll soon see, this will complicate itself. So 
I had to make an adjustment for dead worlds as they don't have the same noticeable weather patterns as other biomes. You could argue that the clear and atmosphereless versions are different, but we're not worrying about that right now. I also have 10 terrain types. Unlike my current PC version of the game, I don't have the actual list of archetypes available to verify. I do remember a few archetypes, you know, like the squiggly worm one, the one with rolling hills, uh, big ass mountains, canyons, and of course floating islands. However, there <laughs> is definitely a contingent of the fan base that will tell me that the launch version of the game had way more varied terrain than today's game. So I'll humor them and I'll give the terrain variable uh, a value of 10. They might be referring to the geometric anomalies that used to be more prominent, such as this one. They're still in the game, by the way, they're just rarer now. Anyway, if you multiply and add all of these variables, you'll end up with 3,420 planet combos, or planet variants. The last variable to add is whether a world is a planet or a moon. Since the rest of these variables aren't affected by whether it's a planet or a moon, we also end up with 3,420 moon combinations. Add these together, and based on this criteria, there were 6,840 world variants. Not bad at all. 6,800 functionally different worlds. Sounds pretty good for a space exploration game, right? So then why did so many people feel like they kept getting repeating planets? Well, you have to remember just how big this game is. If there were over 18 quintillion worlds at launch, which there were, and there were 6,840 unique variants according to this criteria, that would mean each of these variants, each one, would be repeated 2 quadrillion, 696 trillion, 892 billion, 400 million times. Depending on your luck and what features you interact with, you might end up with the 10 seemingly samey planets in a row. You also have to consider that while I calculated 6840 world variants, half of those are only differentiated by the fact that they're moons rather than planets. So if we ignore that, like many folks would, we have half the variation. Then you might have worlds that only have a single variable different than the last one. Sure, it's different, but it's not that different. While biome, terrain, and water make immediate impressions, things like weather or faction might not be as apparent to those who only touch down for a few minutes. There are other factors that play into this, but it's easy to see the shortcomings of this first universe. Every biome had the same gravity, the same cave biome, the same underwater biome. They were all populated by one of three races. They all had the same sentinels, they all shared the same pool of animals, etc. It was predictable in other words. Most planets played the same, with only extreme and treasure planets really standing out. Luckily, Hello Games wasn't done with their procedural generation, and the universe we have today is orders of magnitude more varied. Just see for yourself. And now, a look into the past. Version 1.1 in 2016 completely regenerated the universe. Version 1.3 added 9 new biomes. Version 1.5 next added at least 18 new biomes, maybe more. It also made star systems more varied, leading to ringed planets, uncharted planets, abandoned planets, variation in gravity, and more. 1.7 gave us different underwater biomes for the first time, bringing the total up from 1 to 6. 1.75 added 5 new exotic biomes more variation to crash faders, and the possibility of planets containing varied resources such as salvageable scrap. That meant for the first time since launch, a select few planets now contain the new corrupted sentinel enemies. 3.0 though is the real refresh. Millions of new worlds were added to the original 18 quintillion. Terrain variation doubled instantly. The total number of biomes rose to 79. Flora and fauna variety exploded. Meteorological events added variety. There were new buildings, new biome combinations, new everything, but they didn't stop there. 3.5 tripled cave variation, 4.2 gave us dissonant worlds, with the most unique gameplay of any planet type in the game. And that brings us to today, January 2024, version 4.48. Whew, sorry about that. Alright, let me catch my breath. Uh, while I do, feel free to hit that like button if you don't mind. I... S uh, this isn't even the first time I've recorded this video. I, I've spent way too much time on this video. And if it does well, um, it'll mean a lot. And I can tell my wife, hey, hey told you, see, totally worth it. <laughs> yeah. 
Anywho, I present you my variables. Yes, they are quite impressive, I know. 62 biomes, 5 underwater biomes, 3 cave biomes, 2 mountain biomes, don't worry about that. Planets can have continents now, which is cool. They can have rings, they can have corrupted sentinels or none at all. They can even be abandoned. It's beautiful, isn't it? Multiply all this together and you get 16,070,400 wet planet combination. Easy peasy. Guess we can pack up and wait a minute. Wet planet combinations? You see, certain variables like underwater biomes and continental layouts only apply to planets with water. So this equation only accounts for water worlds. Here's the equation for dry planets. 1,607,040 dry planet combinations in total. Alright, so I'll just add these together and wait a minute again. Didn't I mention Origins adding millions of new planets with new terrain archetypes? <laughs> I did. Luckily, I already thought of that before pretending not to. Observe my prime planet equation. Prime being how these new planets are labeled in the files. They also bring two additional biomes, swamp and lava. So that equates to 1,658,880 dry prime planet combinations. Oh yeah, and I made one for wet planets too, wet prime planets. So that's another 16,588,800 combinations there. So now we should be able to just add those together and wait another minute. I almost forgot about dead and exotic worlds. <laughs> Sorry. Those don't have all the same variables as the other biomes. They never have water, their buildings are always abandoned, and they don't have storms. I also factor in the 20 total terrain archetypes. So we have 64,800 dead planet combinations. All right, so now we're actually ready to add those to wait one more minute. I almost forgot to mention that planets can now be uncharted as well. That removes the faction and inhabited variables and adds in a new variable for robotic fauna, only found on uncharted worlds. So here are all of those. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A lot of calculating, this took me quite a while. I have to separate the dead and exotic worlds for this one since dead biomes never have any fauna, but alrighty, if we add all of those up for real this time, we have 48 million 2,400 planet variants, according to our criteria. Whew, holy moly. That's almost unfathomably larger than the 3,420 planet variants at launch. Moons also have a greater variety in 2024, though nowhere near as much as planets since moons never have bodies of water or rings. Here are all of those equations. Yep, yep, yep. Long story short, we have 1 million 122,400 moon variants today. Add that to the planets, and there are 49,124,880 world variants as of No Man's Sky 4.48. Whew! 49 million compared to 6,840 in 2016. That is unbelievable improvement. That's 7,182 times more variation. Let that sink in, 7,000 times more variation. Uh, let me put it another way. If each planet variant was an inch long, right, so each planet's an inch, 2016's variation would stretch 570 feet. That's about uh, 174 meters for my friends across the pond. Comparatively, 2024's variation would stretch about 775 miles, or about 1,248 kilometers for the scientific among you. That is, coincidentally, almost exactly the width of the great state of Texas, the Lone Star State, home of the Alamo, Whataburger, and Kanaju. <laughs> That's a lot of variation. Now some of y'all are probably nodding your heads in approval. Yes, you say, variation is better than it's ever been which is a 100% true statement. Irrefutable, I'd say. Yet at the same time, some of y'all are probably calling BS on this. I mean, sure, I've multiplied and added a bunch of variables, but you don't have to visit 49 million planets to feel like you've seen everything the game has to offer. Something's not adding up, right? <laughs> 
Welcome to part two of this video. No Man's Sky's perceived variation quantified and why it's still too repetitive for some people. Let me start by reiterating that variety in No Man's Sky is the best it's ever been right now, period. If you believe the 1.0 launch foundation or Atlas Rises universes offered more visual or gameplay variety, you're wrong. I'm sorry you had to hear it from me, but it's true. However, you might not be wrong about that 49 million not telling the whole story. So let's look at variation a little differently. And by that I mean a lot differently. So here's a graph with all the biomes in 1.03 versus 4.48, 7 versus 79. Honestly, it's a fair representation of variation too. After all, once you visit a hexagon planet, visiting another one won't be all that different. Even if the terrain is different or the sky that belongs to no man is a different color, your second visit won't be as magical as your first. Just won't. In a sense, you've already discovered this type of planet. It's technically different, but it can feel the same. So, sure, factors like having robotic fauna or extreme sentinels might spice it up a little, but for the most part, it doesn't necessarily feel unique. Still, even at this most cynical level, variation has indeed increased 11-fold. On top of that, every cave on every planet used to have the same colorful biome. Sure, the specific stalactites and troglit tulips might have been swapped out, but every planet had a colorful cave full of stuff. Nowadays, that original cave biome has been remixed and is one of three available, each visually distinct from the other. Here's a mossy cave, a rocky one, a jungle one. Humidity levels, colors, and rare resources can also vary by planet. Caves are easily more than three times as varied as they used to be. Same with oceans. Uh, those used to be based on the same coral biome, but there are now six possible underwater biomes, including the original. There's also a lot more to do underwater than you could before, but <laughs> that's too much to cover in this video. The last biome type is the mountain biome. You've probably noticed that craters and certain areas of planets will be void of the usual grass and plants and instead appear to be barren and rocky. Those patches are actually what's called a mountain biome. As far as I remember, there was only one in 2016, maybe? Now there are two, but honestly though, I don't think most folks can tell the difference. So yeah, variation doubled here. I guess. <laughs> if you add all of these columns together, we can see the simplest, most cynical representation of variety between the two versions of the game. Still an impressive improvement. 10 total biomes to see in 2016, and 90 total in 2024. Nine times the variation. 16 times the detail. Wow. I don't care who you are, but that's some good variety. Yet, the number one suggestion I've seen players beg for every year is still more variety. Must, they scream. I mean, if you've played for hundreds of hours, chances are you've probably come across all 90 of those biomes already. Sure, maybe you've never seen a hydro garden with bubbles, but you might not feel the need to. After all, you've been to a hydro garden planet before, and you've seen bubbles, so how much different would it really be to see them at the same time? I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate here since I actually got really, really excited when I found this planet. It's the only one I've found in 800 hours. <laughs> but so far, I've shown you a very technical interpretation of variety. 49 million variants and a very cynical one, which is 90 variants. Big difference, right? But I think there's a third, more subjective interpretation that lies somewhere in the middle. You see, variety lives in the eye of the beholder. At the end of the day, whether or not a planet feels unique depends wholly on the player's personal experience, their memory, what they do on a planet, and what they're looking for. For example, if you're planet hopping and only spend a few minutes on each planet you visit, a lot of factors won't even apply to you. For example, underground and underwater biomes only make a difference if you actually visit them. If you land on top of a mountain, scan some plants, and then take off, well, you're missing out on part of what makes that planet unique. Which is not a critique of your playing style, I'm just saying why certain variation won't apply to many players. On the flip side, you could have two planets with the same biome, right? Same terrain, oceans, faction, 
However, one is purple and populated by tentacle creatures, and the other is green and full of big predators that constantly harass you. Those two planets would feel completely different, despite being alike in most ways. Funny enough, I didn't even factor color into my 49 million figure, but you can imagine if each biome had three color options, which by the way, they have dozens, but if they had three, right? Suddenly we're up to 147 million variants. And if each biome has two creature options, which again, they have many, uh, we're at nearly 300 million, just like that. You get to a point where numbers don't even matter. And like I said, there are considerably more color palettes and fauna combinations than that, not to mention flora combinations within each biome. Clouds can vary quite a lot between planets and moons, but I don't know how to quantify that either. Instead, I'd like to circle back to that idea of variety being in the eye of the beholder. For example, if you visit 10 lush planets in a row, then the first desert you see is going to feel pretty novel. The same goes in the opposite direction. After 10 deserts in a row, a jungle would be a nice change of pace. The same applies to ocean biomes, to caves, to animal points of interest, anything in the game really. Whatever you've been seeing will feel boring, and whatever you haven't seen in a while is going to be interesting. For example, I saved the glyphs of this planet because it's the only planet I've ever found in seven years that contained these floating mutant plants. Nothing else about the planet is particularly remarkable or memorable, but this one rare element elevated it to a unique discovery in my book. Same with the bubbles on this exotic planet. Paradise planets with white grass are so rare, I don't even think I have a screenshot of my own to share with you. My home planet Sand Dune is special because it doesn't have any storms or sentinels. It's completely stable and a rocky desert to boot. It's my ideal planet in other words, and I've spent the last two years trying to find a viable replacement. That goal has led to me visiting more deserts than any other biome since Frontiers released. So whenever I land on like a radioactive or a toxic planet, I'm usually still surprised by what I find. I stick to mostly populated systems too, right? So I don't visit many red, green, or blue stars. And that means I miss out on a lot of weirder planets. I rarely visit uncharted systems since I enjoy modern conveniences, as most people do. Which means I've only seen a handful of robotic creatures. Ever. In other words, I have artificially limited the variety of my own game through my actions. On the other hand, I only have to take a couple steps outside my routines to see something fresh and surprising whenever I like. If I specifically wanted to see something new, I could just adjust my search patterns and account for that. All of this probably seems like a wild tangent, <laughs> but it illustrates why so many people might disagree about how varied or repetitive their experience in No Man's Sky is. If you only visit low conflict systems, you may never see a trading post attacked by pirates. If you skip uncharted systems, you'll never find one of these guys. So here's a third interpretation of No Man's Sky's variety. Novel experiences. You see, the promise of No Man's Sky's vast scale is that there are unique experiences to be found among the quintillions of unexplored worlds. We can concede that the technical variety of planet combinations is in the millions, if not billions, depending on the criteria. However, while visiting a new planet is technically always a novel experience, it doesn't always feel that way. However, visiting a new biome for the first time does usually feel pretty novel, like a new personal discovery. So if we look at this graph again, we can think of these little bars, each biome, as a novel experience. Launch had 10, and now we have 90. However, there were a lot more novel discoveries in 2016 than just biomes. I made a quick list here of what you might consider quote unquote novel the first time you experience it. Each terrain type and fauna table could be considered a novel discovery. This doesn't include everything, of course, like the first time you use a landing pad or anything, but experiences like the first treasure planet you found or the first time you get destroyed by a sentinel dreadnought would certainly impress you and make it feel like there are incredible experiences to be found in this universe that you don't encounter constantly. Finding Omegon or Radnox on a planet was also noteworthy and extremely rare at the time. It's a completely subjective list, to be sure, but it'll help us quantify and visualize something as abstract as someone's novel discoveries, right? So there are 45 novel discoveries on this list that we can add to the 10 biomes for a total of 55 novel discoveries. Now, 
obviously, obviously this is an understatement. There weren't only 55 novel experiences in the game at launch, there were countless. Bear with me though, for the purposes of this comparison. Now, let's look at version 4.48. Twice the terrain, tons of new fauna tables, and lots of random encounters. Now, I'm sticking to planetary events for this video, so no crazy space stuff. Still, there's no shortage of crazy things to find on planets these days. From lightning storms, tornadoes, and changes in gravity, to rare structures and settlements, to other players themselves. There are a lot of novel first time or rare experiences to find on No Man's Sky's planets in 2024. My personal list adds up to 135. <laughs> Don't ask me how long it took to put that together. So if you add those experiences to the biomes, we have 225 novel planetary experiences or discoveries in 4.48. Again, I know seemingly arbitrary number, but I am trying to illustrate something abstract and frankly unquantifiable. Speaking of which, let's compare the two versions with our new numbers, 55 to 125. That's about four times as much variation in 2024 compared to 2016. While this doesn't take into account the inherent, and I cannot stress this enough, limitless variety of gameplay scenarios now possible on planets, let alone in space. For those purely interested in discovering new things on planets, you know, like planet hopping players, I think it paints a more accurate picture of how variety has evolved. Of course, it doesn't paint anywhere near a complete picture of how gameplay has evolved over the years. It doesn't take into account combinations of gameplay loops or anything like that. And it also doesn't take into account something that I think many people don't consider immediately, which is time. Luckily, I can fix that. Look at this. It's a graph depicting a theoretical distribution of these novel experiences across a playtime of 500 hours. I know that seems like a lot of hours, but trust me, plenty of folks have played for much longer than that. In a single year, mind you, let alone seven. It should go without saying that each player's experience is different, and things like playstyle and luck will make a huge difference in what they encounter and when. However, I tried to distribute the events listed according to my own experience and other folks' anecdotal evidence. As you can see, most of the novel discoveries occur in the first 25 hours and then drop off pretty quickly. After 100 hours and 1.03, you've probably seen most of the unique stuff there was to find. Sure, there are near infinite combinations of things you haven't seen yet, but I think this depicts the burnout a lot of day one players faced early on. In contrast, 4.48 does a much better job of distributing novel discoveries across hundreds of hours of playtime. The first 25 hours still have the most new experiences, of course, since, like, literally everything's new at that point. But what's interesting is that the next 25 hours are also filled with almost as many surprises, as you gain the ability to visit new systems and planets and explore them more efficiently. Late game content, such as that introduced in Echoes, also helps save some surprises for players who have completed the main storyline. Throw in some super rare combinations and weighted probabilities, and you'll still be finding a lot of stuff at 200 hours. After that, we do experience a drop off, but there are still a few white whales for dedicated players to hunt. So as you can see, it's not just that the novel discoveries have multiplied by four. The main discovery period has also been extended from roughly 25 hours of gameplay to 200. You might think I'm giving No Man's Sky too much credit, but even I haven't found everything on this list and I'm over 800 hours in. After all, you also can't forget the increase in non-planetary activities available to us today. Not to mention if a player spends dozens of hours base building or looking for a specific planet or doing dungeons, right? Those discoveries could be pushed back even further. It's just fascinating to think about. So. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed my three interpretations of No Man's Sky's planetary generation variety. Mathematically, there are over 49 million planet types in the game. Cynically, there are about 90 biomes to explore. And subjectively, there are over 200 novel experiences to discover. In every metric, the game is leaps and bounds ahead of where it was at launch. There are more biomes, more oceans, more caves, more animals, more plants, more resources, more points of interest, more random encounters, more weapons, more ships, more quests, more lore, 
and more gameplay loops and features than ever before. While many planets may begin to feel predictable after a while, Hello Games have done a great job increasing the time before that occurs for many players. That said, the number one request I've seen every year since launch is to increase variety on planets. I hope I've shown you why simply adding a few hundred new procedural assets to the pool wouldn't magically fix that predictable feeling for longtime players. Instead, I have a few different ideas on how Hello Games could meaningfully enhance that sense of exploration and discovery without just adding new planets. But <laughs> this video is freaking long, so I'm going to have to split that off into its own video. And if you're interested in seeing something like that, please consider subscribing. It's free and it helps me out a ton. In the meantime though, let me know your thoughts on No Man's Sky's planet variety in the comments below. Were you previously aware of how many variants are currently possible in the game? Did you play at launch? How long did it take before you felt like you had seen everything? Are there any thousand plus hour players still discovering new things? You see, I'm the kind of player who gets excited about minor variation, like very little minor changes, so I've never grown bored or felt like I've seen everything, but I know many players don't share that sentiment, and that's okay. I think if you play 500 hours of a game, you're probably entitled to an opinion. <laughs> anyway, don't forget to like the video if you appreciate the work I put into it. And if you thought it was bad, I apologize. Uh, thanks for watching anyways, and feel free to dislike it. Again though, subscribe if you don't want to miss the next video about improving variety in No Man's Sky. I also do tons of other video game deep dives. For example, I have an hour long Assassin's Creed video that was supposed to come out at the end of last year that's still on the way. Look forward to that. <laughs> I'm not a full time content creator, so no promises on when that'll be ready. I, I still have a another job that I have to do, but uh, thank you so much for your support and thank you to my valued members for your support. I should have another members only live stream this month. And if you want access to that or other members only content and perks, it's fairly cheap. I'll put a link in the description. <laughs> well, thank you everyone again for watching. Here's to another exciting year and I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Special thanks to No Man's Sky Discoveries and the No Man's Sky Wiki for their help with reference. No Man's Sky Disco helpfully listed which files to view in order for me to verify data myself. Not an ad, just a thanks, bye.